This lecture will focus on um, fixing the damage done by the Civil War both emotionally and physically and it's a period known as Reconstruction. So at the end of the Civil War there were some major major problems left over behind from the Civil War and really these problems were were hit on or felt on both sides but they were felt the most um, on the south in the southern side because remember the, all the fighting was there and so they're the ones that had to make the change they're the ones that lost and all of the fighting was in their land so it was really really hard for them to fix the damage that was done there um, first off because all the fighting was there most if not all of the land that was destroyed all of the houses all of the um, cities burnt to the ground all the rail tracks railroad tracks pulled up um, you remember that 60 mile swath that Sherman left behind in his uh, march to the sea all that was destroyed so there were bridges ruined and roads ruined and everything was messed up and so they really had to start fixing that up that was a big problem the second thing is the slaves were now free and we needed to figure out two things based on that these slaves they had nothing they didn't own anything they were property before and so they're now set free but they have no job they have no food they have no clothes they have nothing and so the question becomes how can we help them survive and also the white people are mad that the slaves are freed in the south and so how do we deal with their anger um, at the slaves uh, the third problem in the south is that a lot of people were left homeless and some of the people that were left homeless first off were uh, freed slaves remember they didn't own anything so they didn't have a house they had nowhere to go and so they were kind of stuck without a house and then there were other people white people that had houses before but they were destroyed in the fighting and so they were left without a home too and so they had to figure out what do we do about these people that have nowhere to go also the emotional problem was a really big problem because both sides were angry at the other because they were just killing each other and now they had to be um, fellow citizens and countrymen again that's kind of hard to do immediately after fight to shake and make up and be friends again is very difficult so Abraham Lincoln came up with a plan to try and get the country back get the south back as part of the country and fix it as quickly as possible and so because he wanted it quick quickly fixed he decided to make it very easy for the south to join the country again and so um, he came up with a plan called the 10% plan and the 10% plan was you'd give a piece of paper and as soon as 10% of the voters in the state 10% only of all the people in the state uh, swore that they were going to be loyal to the US then they could have a new state government and they could rejoin the Union and they could start setting up their constitution and everything like that the only other requirement was they uh, you your new government had to end slavery you could not have slavery at all and so um, like I said new government had to end slavery but then you could come back into the national government you could send senators you could send representatives you could send all these members of Congress to start working on laws and everything could be kind of back to normal the other thing that he agreed on was amnesty for former Confederates and amnesty and I think this is a definition you need to write down amnesty is a group pardon so it's forgiving a but forgiving a single person for their crimes is called a pardon but if you forgive a large number of people all at once for their crimes that is called amnesty or giving amnesty to them and so he wanted to give that to basically all of the former confederates except for the really top government leaders and the top generals who were really responsible for all the actions because he thought you know the regular everyday soldier was just being told what to do they weren't coming up with the plans um, to break off from and attack american soldiers okay so six months later however Congress decided that they didn't like Lincoln's plan it was way too easy and so they made up a much stricter plan that they wanted and it came through in something called the Wade Davis bill and this said that if uh, that same piece of paper that oath that you're gonna be loyal to the United States at least 50% at least half of your voters had to sign that oath so at least half of the people had to you know kind of swallow their pride and say we are going to be faithful to this country that they didn't agree with before 
Uh, the other thing that it did, much stricter, is if you volunteered to fight for the South. So unless you were drafted, every single soldier that fought for the South, you were not allowed to vote on the new governments, the new state governments. So you can't vote on the people who are going to make your new state constitution. Um, Lincoln didn't like this. He thought it was too strict. He thought it would make people angry. He thought it would make the South um, angry and not give support to the Republican Party. So what he did was actually pretty smart. He decided to just refuse to sign it. He didn't veto it. Um, he just refused to sign it. And so if you don't veto it, then there's very little chance that an override can happen. Um, and so it never ended up becoming a law just because Lincoln kind of just let it sit on his desk and never signed it. Um, and so... The radical Republicans were obviously angry, angry at Lincoln about this. Even though he was a Republican, he was trying to be easy on the South, and the radical Republicans were trying to be a little bit harder on them. Um, and so he wanted to keep the Confederates from gaining power. That's what the or I'm seeing. I mean, the radical Republicans wanted to keep the governments from gaining power again and getting that power back and so they thought we need to be strict whereas again Lincoln thought he would get the support back better if he made it easy and didn't make the people angry in the south so I talked a lot about on the last slide about people that were just released from slavery and how they really had very little to to live off of, to have, to own. And so these people were called freedmen. Freedmen were the slaves who were freed by the war. And they had a lot of needs, a lot of needs uh, to fulfill, and they didn't have very many resources to fulfill those needs. And so the Freedmen's Bureau was created to try and help these people as much as possible. And it was created for a couple of different reasons. One of them was for um, lawyers to sign on with the Freedmen's Bureau, and then they could give legal protection to the slaves uh, if their rights were being taken away or if they were being sued unfairly or anything like that. It would give them protection in the court system. But also there was a really, really strong thirst or desire by the uh, f newly freed slaves to be educated, to try and get education. And so the Freedmen's Bureau started a set up schools and when they set up schools they the whole goal was to try and help these uh, sl former slave kids learn to read learn to write um, just kind of learn all the things you learn at school and the people that were teachers were mostly white women and african-american women from the north so people that had always been free people that weren't slaves because they were the ones that had been educated before and it was kind of interesting because communities they didn't have nobody had money to set up these schools nobody had money to pay these teachers and so communities of slaves would or former slaves freedmen would put together their pennies and their dollars and whatever they could get together as a community and they would uh, pay the teachers themselves out of their pockets the parents of these kids and so one of these teachers was Edmonia Highgate and Edmonia Highgate was the former daughter well was the daughter of a freed slave uh someone who was a slave had been freed um, and she ended up teaching in Louisiana okay um, and so it's just one example of the type of person that would be a teacher within these schools. Um, and people were really excited. The kids were really excited to go to school and excited to learn. And they were so excited that um, many of them had to walk very long distances to get to the school. I mean, we're talking like walking from between three and eight miles every single day to get into school and then walking three to eight miles back every single day to get home. Um, which is, <clears throat> you guys have run a mile, a mile is a, a pretty long way, and they were walking three to eight of them every day. And so um, the other thing that started to come out of this, come out of the Freedmen's Bureau, is in the South. It was the first time there were public schools, and these public schools in the South that were being set up were set up to educate everyone, no matter if they were white, black, whatever. And this ended up um, kind of giving birth or giving birth to the idea of many new universities that were created in the South at this time. So just five days after um, Robert E. Lee had surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse, Abraham Lincoln and his wife and um, another kind of up-and-coming young military officer and his wife went out to the theater. They went to Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., um, and they were going to see a comedy called Our American Cousin. 
and this happened on April 14th, 1865. Um, the per well, <clears throat> a person who was there at the theater waiting, kind of waiting for him, was John Wilkes Booth. And John Wilkes Booth was kind of a celebrity. He was uh, an actor. And so you got to think some great actors there at the Playhouse. And so that's kind of a normal thing. You kind of expect that um, when when you see John Wilkes Booth hanging out around. Um, the other thing that John Wilkes Booth was is he was a Confederate sympathizer. He was on the side of the South. He thought they should be able to be their own country, and he was mad that the South had just lost the war. And so he had hidden a pistol inside of his jacket, and he uh, was able to get up the stairs and into the president's private box. And he waited for the exact right moment, and he knew, because he had acted in this play before, he knew that when there would be a very big laugh. And so when that big laugh happened and the whole crowd laughed at something funny that had happened, he shot Lincoln in the back of the head. Um, Lincoln ended up dying. Well, they, they had to take him down. They grabbed him, and they moved him down the stairs and went out across the street, and there were doctors there trying to help him out, and he ended up dying two hours later. Um, but John Wilkes Booth also ended up escaping. He jumped off the, um, well, he ended up fighting with that army officer and hurting him. And then he jumped off onto the stage and broke his leg. And then he ran off or hobbled off as quick as he could to get out of there and escaped. Um, but eventually about two weeks later, they, um, <clears throat> they chased down Booth and they trapped him inside of a barn. And he was stuck in this barn, and they thought, you know, if we go in the front, we're going to end up losing people. We're going to end up with people dying. And so they told him to surrender. He wouldn't surrender. And so what they decided to do was to light the barn on fire. And so they lit the barn on fire. And then as he was running out, uh, they try, or he tried to escape. Uh, during this attempt, or not attempt, during this assassination plan, there was it was a big assassination plan. Other people were supposed to be killed, and there were supposed to be eight people at least involved in killing the president and these other people. Um, eight people ended up being convicted. Four of them ended up being hanged to death because of their... Uh, involvement in this plot but really the only of one of these people that was successful was john wilkes booth and so um abraham lincoln was dead john wilkes booth was caught and dead and the nation was very very sad because the man who had been such an important part of the civil war and of the country during this time was now dead and so all the way back to his home state of illinois there was a very slow funeral perspective funeral train or a funeral procession okay and so they they were just carrying the body back through these towns and it, people would act almost like it was a very sad parade where they'd come out and pay their last respects to him as he um his body was moved through their town and so the next president was andrew johnson who was Lincoln's vice president. And Andrew Johnson, the 17th president, was a Southern Democrat. But he was a Democrat from the South who stayed loyal with the Union. Okay? And so um, he was the one that would have to move on with Reconstruction. So since Johnson was from the South and he had stayed with the Union, he was bitter with the Confederates, very, very angry at them for doing what they did. Um, they thought he would end up with a more strict plan, way more strict than what Lincoln wanted, the 10% plan. But it was kind of weird because he actually wanted an easier plan, a more lenient plan, uh, one that was less difficult for the people to become or the South to become states. Um, and Johnson's plan which he pushed through without even asking Congress about, and so the states just started doing it. His plan was to give amnesty to all former Confederates, or most of the former Confederates. Um, and so he, he forgave them as a whole group, and he said the South can set up new governments if they want. The only rule is they have to abolish slavery. So nobody had to sign any uh, document that said they were going to be loyal to the Union. They just had to say, we're going to definitely get rid of slavery um, and so the south followed these rules the south said we will get rid of slavery we will ratify the 13th amendment which was another requirement that they had to do and um so they went through with it and then what ended up happening is they they just 
voted in whoever they wanted because they could vote for confederates they could vote for anybody they wanted and so a whole bunch of confederates got voted in to start these governments and got voted into senate and voted into the house of representatives and they started to show up to senate and congress was very angry because they had not given them the right to do this the president johnson andrew johnson had done this kind of all by himself never not asked anything about or from them and so Congress was very angry. So a committee was formed in Congress to create a new plan for the South, to create a new plan for Reconstruction. And so they started to, uh, started to have hearings about issues that were happening in the South. So the new plans committee started their hearings and they had, uh, a lot of people started to come to them and say we're having a lot of problems with black codes and so they were upset at these black codes and black codes is kind of a name that was given to um, a whole bunch of new laws that were put together uh, in the southern states that were designed to control African Americans to replace what was slavery with basically more slavery just a different kind or so or near slavery okay and so uh, a couple examples of these uh, black codes are first off in Mississippi there were a couple of them um, one of them is uh, if you were the son or daughter of a slave you could not vote and you could not serve on juries you are not allowed to do those things and the other thing is if you're black and you couldn't pay a fine then a white person could pay the fine for you so if you got arrested you got in trouble and you had to pay a fine the white person could pay it for you and then you would have to work it off for the or, or you would have to work for that white person for free until you worked off that amount of money and so basically the sheriff was hiring you out as a slave with a time limit um, and so it was really they were hearing these things and the radical republicans were getting more angry and the radical republicans the reason they're called radical is because they really really were pushing far far to their side they wanted uh african americans to have all the same rights they wanted it to be done and to be done very very quickly and so just to look at the radical Republicans and what their goals were, first off, it was to prevent former Confederates from gaining power. So don't let those people that screwed up the government before, don't let them get any power. And then second off, it was to protect the freedmen, protect those uh, newly freed slaves and their right to vote. And so those were the two main radical Republican goals. So one of the things that was pushed through most or a lot by Andrew Johnson, as well as the radical Republicans, was the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. That went through on January of 1865, and it was approved at, on that date by Congress, and then it was ratified later that year, that exact same year. And what that did is it banned slavery and forced labor. So you could not make someone work for you for nothing, and you could not have slavery at all. And, and so... Um, the other thing that it added in is that Congress also has the power to enforce this 13th Amendment with new laws if they wanted to, if they if they want to write that up. OK, and so they started to make these laws and enforce them. And one of the laws that they created was the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And the Civil Rights Act of 1866 said that African-Americans were citizens and it gave those civil rights, those first through uh, 12th Amendment gave those same rights to everybody except for the natives they didn't include the natives yet um, and so they gave those civil rights um, the problem was it was vetoed andrew johnson vetoed it he did not like it uh, he thought it was too radical it was too much and even though it was vetoed it went back to congress and they voted and they had a two-thirds vote and there was an override and the civil rights act of 1866 became a law the problem was they realized that even it's a law even though um, it is a law they thought about that Dred Scott decision and how the, all those laws and Missouri Compromise and all that kind of stuff had just been thrown out because the Supreme Court decided that it didn't fit with the Constitution. So they thought the only way we could keep it from being reversed by the Supreme Court is to make it into an amendment. And so they put together the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment says everyone that's born here or naturalized here so any citizen no matter what color or race you are gets the exact same rights and so uh, basically if you put that into 
the Constitution, that's saying no laws can be made that take those rights away from anybody. So the main question in the 1866 election that people could not agree on is, should we go with Johnson and make it an easy reconstruction, or should we go with the radical re Republicans and make it a very difficult uh, reconstruction to bring them back into the country? And so there were – both sides were really mad, and so there were riots, especially in the South, over this 1866 election. And African Americans were killed in Memphis and New Orleans by white rioters and police, and really – this happened all across the South, okay? And people got mad at these deaths happening, and they decided, you know what? We can't be easy on these people. They're animals. They're not uh, acting right, and um, you know they're trying to kill people. And so we need to change it to a stricter reconstruction. And so the radicals ended up taking charge. And so when they took charge, they put together the Reconstruction Act of 1867, and this was a very hard reconstruction. This was a very radical reconstruction. Um, it, it made it very hard on the states in the South. And what they did is they took all of the governments that were against the 14th Amendment that did not vote to ratify – the 14th Amendment, and they took away their rights to be states. Uh, they, and when they did that, they divided those states, those areas, into five military districts. And these military districts were literally patrolled by soldiers. The military was ruling over them, making sure they did uh, whatever the radical Republicans wanted them to do. And so they not only said that, they not only said, we're going to control you and make sure that you treat these African Americans right, but all every single African American also has the right to vote. And so the soldiers went through and helped them register. And by the time the next election came up, more there were more African Americans registered to vote than there were white Americans in the South registered to vote. And so every single Southern state was won by the Republicans. And the Republicans quickly started to rewrite those states or all those states' constitutions to reflect their ideas. So radical reconstruction gets a really, really – there's a really bad view of it in history because there was a lot of corruption in the government, and there was also kind of a lot of out-of-control spending by the government. But there were some things that happened that were very positive during radical reconstruction, and that's what this slide is about. First off, it got many African Americans involved in politics. There were uh, – the most of the people that – most of the African American people that were – Involved were free-born African Americans who had been free their entire life, had the time to be educated, all that kind of stuff, and then people, African Americans, who had become Union soldiers. Okay, and so over the course of like 1872 to 1901, there were many African Americans who were getting involved. They were uh, getting involved on a local level as sheriffs and council people, and you know, mayors and stuff like that. But they were also getting involved on a national level as representatives and senators. There were 16 representatives that were African American during that time and two senators. The first two African American senators were these men right here, Hiram Revels and Blanche Bruce. So what do we write about them? That they were the first two African American senators. Um, the other things that happened is uh, that Freedmen's Bureau schools started to open up the idea that there should be state schools in the south so uh, the state should be running schools and everybody should get educated by them and so the very first public schools started to show up in the south which is very important for educating the people um, it also changed the tax rules so it was a little more even across the wealth levels um, and then it also changed the the voting rules uh, so that it was much fairer and got more people involved in voting and lastly um, an increased property rights for women. Now, all of this was happening. The other positive things that were happening at the same time, even though they cost a lot of money, was people rebuilding the bridges, the roads, the buildings, the railroads, all that kind of stuff, really trying to build up infrastructure in the South as well. So at this time, the Republicans were building a following, especially in the South. Um, and in the South, there were three groups that really were kind of on the Republican side. And a lot of these these two definitely scallywags and, and carpetbaggers were kind of nasty names that people in the South were giving these people. So I'll kind of explain it, but they definitely wouldn't want to call themselves scallywags or carpetbaggers. But um, you'll kind of see what they were. So the scallywags, and scallywag just kind of means a nasty person 
person that's you know going against everybody else and not helping out and all that kind of stuff the scalawags were the people in the south that were white who were always against the secession they didn't like the idea they thought we should um definitely be um we should definitely be staying as a country with the North the whole time. The second group who obviously was going to support the Republicans was the freed slaves. Okay, Obviously, the freed slaves are going to um, join the side of the people who gave them their freedom and gave them their rights. So they liked the Republicans for sure because they were fighting to get them rights. The last group that was for the Republicans were carpetbaggers. And carpetbaggers were people from the north, white people from the north, who went, decided to grab their stuff and move south to start a business, so to make more money because they realized that all the businesses were probably um, struggling down there, or to look for political office to get some sort of power. So they said these are people that were so hungry for money or power that they literally just grabbed uh, some of their stuff, threw it in a cheap carpet bag, like you can see this guy up here is, is carrying a couple of cheap carpet bags, and ran down to the south as quick as they could to take away that power and money from the from the southern people. The radical people were really against President Johnson. The big fight of the Reconstruction was uh, the radical Republicans versus President Johnson. So they decided to go through with impeachment. And remember, impeachment is literally bringing formal charges against a president, trying to get them removed from office. And, and a president can be impeached from treason, can be impeached for high crimes and other misdemeanors, and can also be impeached for bribery. And so they said... He has done a lot of things that are impeachable, and so they brought him to this court case, and being impeached just basically means there's going to be this hearing, and then they're going to vote if they want to kick him out or not, and so they went through this hearing. He did the impeachment process. And then they voted if they were going to remove him. 35 people voted to remove him. 19 voted uh, to not remove President Johnson. Uh, this, it, and remember, or hopefully remember, to impeach a president, you need two-thirds vote. And so they were literally one vote short from removing Andrew Johnson from office. He was soon removed later anyways by an election. And so um, in the election of 1868, Ulysses S. Grant became the Republican, pres or Republican candidate. And remember, Ulysses S. Grant is that a war hero, the one who finally won the war, the one good general who finally pushed through at the end. Um, and he was the Republican candidate. He was that war hero. He ended up winning 26 of the 34 states. So he kind of dominated um, this election and quickly became the 18th president of the U.S. He was not a radical Republican, though. He was selected as a moderate Republican. So he was more um, in the lines of kind of like Andrew Johnson and, and Abraham Lincoln. He kind of wanted to be a little bit nicer to the South. And so with his election as president, again, that kind of started to the radicals started to kind of lose their control, lose their power over the reconstruction process. Um, soon after Ulysses S. Grant became president, the Fifteenth Amendment was also put through. It was put through in 1868. Um, and basically the 15th Amendment says you cannot keep someone from voting just based on their race. And so the 15th Amendment is a very important amendment, but it's, it was kind of weak, especially at the beginning, because the states started to do poll taxes and require that you are a property owner to vote. And so this basically got rid of African Americans. It took away that ability because most African Americans were not didn't have enough money to pay the taxes or to own property and so basically it just said only rich people can vote and uh that really you know that really didn't allow the african americans to vote at all because they were you know they were just released from slavery they had nothing however how did the white poor people not vote? Well, they also put in something called a grandfather clause. And the grandfather clause said, you don't have to follow these laws. You don't have to pay poll taxes. You don't have to be a property owner if your grandfather or your father voted in the last election. And the last election was before African Americans were given their right to vote. So it's basically saying, if you're white, you're good to go. If you're black, you can't vote. Okay, so it was kind of weak because it didn't really do what it was supposed to do.
So many of the Confederates were angry uh, because they were shut out of the power that they had over these African American people. They were not allowed to exercise it anymore, and so many of them created the Ku Klux Klan. And the Ku Klux Klan was a secret society that was created to terrorize African Americans. It was created to scare them, right? Um, and scare them into, I guess, giving up their power or leaving, or I'm not sure what exactly they were trying to accomplish, but they definitely didn't want them to vote. And so they would use violence and intimidation. They would try and scare them, and if they couldn't scare them, they would use violence on them to get them to stop you know, claiming more power and taking more power and acting like they had this power. And so these people, to hide their identity, because they were oftentimes doing illegal things, wore these white robes with the hoods. And you can see the pictures right here, but they're kind of iconic. That's what Ku Klux Klan outfit kind of looks like. And they would yell threats at people in the middle of the night outside of their houses. They would throw rocks through their windows. They would burn big wooden crosses in, in front of their yard and all kinds of different stuff and if that didn't work if they still went out and voted or something like that they would capture them they would whip them they might torture them they might shoot them and kill them or oftentimes they would take them down to the tree hang them by the neck until they were dead so it was a really really nasty thing hundreds of people died during reconstruction just at the hands of the ku klux klan alone and during this time because that was happening african-american voting really started to decline really started to go down so reconstruction started to come to an end because really a lot of people were starting to forget about the civil war and not worry about the problems of the civil war and instead they wanted to focus on you know their own selfish lives they wanted to focus on making their own lives better and so as people started to care a little bit less about you know uh, all the other little things they, and more about themselves they started to not care so much about the re radical republicans agenda and the radical republicans support went down and all of the republican support went down as well because grant had made a number of appointments and appointments meaning he had put people in positions of power um, whether it was you know secretary of state or any cabinet positions or federal judges or whatever other positions of power that you can think of and as this person or as uh he was making these appointments, he made them to his really good friends. So instead of picking someone who he thought would be really good at the job, he just picked someone who was his friend. And his friends ended up being corrupt. And they all were trying to, as you can see in this uh, cartoon here, it's Grant holding the government cake and everybody else is trying to grab a piece of it. And they're trying to get some of it. And so they ended up being corrupt. And a bunch of terrible things happened. Um in his presidency but he had nothing to do with it he had no corruption at all no part in the corruption but his reputation suffered and because his reputation suffered so did the reputation of the republican party and so people started to lose their trust lose trust in the uh, political party or republican party uh, by 1874 all but three of the southern states were controlled by Democrats. So people wanted full amnesty for the South. People wanted to pull the troops out of the South. They wanted it to be over. And so um, in giving them some of that freedom back, they started to decide, well, we kind of want to be with the Democrats. We don't want to um, just be with the Republicans anymore. And so a lot of the changes that those Republicans had made were really pretty temporary a lot of the things that they had done like getting all of the african americans out and ready to vote and you know more african americans voting than white people and all that kind of stuff that kind of started to fall apart as soon as reconstruction kind of started to end then the election of 1876 happened, and this is really the thing that ended Reconstruction. Um, the election of 1876 was between, between a Democrat for president, a Democrat from New York named Samuel Tilden, and a Republican from Ohio named Rutherford B. Hayes. And um, Rutherford B. Hayes really wanted to and and the republicans wanted to continue reconstruction and keep it going and samuel tilden the democrats wanted it to be over thought it was time to move on and all that okay and so the election happened 
And there were three states that were disputed, three states that could not decide who had won in those states. They were too close to call. They would have to have recounts and figure that all out. Okay. Um, but then they looked at the popular vote and they realized that uh, Samuel Tilden had won the popular vote by about 250,000 people. So 250,000 more people voted for, Rutherford, or for Samuel Tilden than voted for Rutherford B. Hayes. And so this overall percentage of, of people went to Tilden by a long, long shot, by a lot of people. Uh, the only problem was with those three states not counting, he was one electoral vote short of um, winning the presidency. So if he got even one electoral vote from those three states that had 20 electoral votes, then he would win the election outright. Um, and for Rutherford B. Hayes to win, he had to get all 20 of those votes. So Congress decided that they had to uh, create a committee to decide what they were going to do. This committee had 15 members, most of them were Republicans, and they decided that they would give all of the votes to Hayes and let Hayes win, even though Hayes probably shouldn't have won. I mean, probably Tilden would have gotten at least one of those electoral votes out of the 20 from the three states that were um, arguing about who they had picked. And so Hayes ended up winning and the Democrats didn't complain about it. And the reason they didn't complain about it is because Rutherford B. Hayes went to the Democrats when this was being decided and secretly agreed. He said that we will end Reconstruction, which is what you want, will end Reconstruction if you don't fight against me becoming the president. And so as soon as he became president, he immediately removed all of the troops from the South. And the next slide, we'll look at the election map real quick. So you can see the states that voted for the Republicans and the states that voted for the Democrats. And you kind of have to pay attention down in the corner here because it's a little strange to us. Usually we think of Republicans as red, but on this particular map, uh, the blue states are the ones that voted Republican and the red states are the ones that voted Democrat. And so you can see a lot of the North voted Republican um, and a lot of the South voted Democrat. So without the protection of the radical Republicans in the South, um, some things really started to come up that, that were laws that kind of went against African Americans and made their lives harder. Um, and one of those things was when voting, um, they or the people in the South charged a poll tax. And a poll tax was basically charging someone money, some fee, whether it's small or big or whatever, it's charging someone money just to come and vote. And so a lot of the poor white people and the freedmen, the uh, slaves that had been freed, didn't vote. They, they didn't couldn't afford to vote. They couldn't, you know, be spending the sum of their little tiny bit of money to, uh, you know, spend it on voting, which they should be allowed to do for free. Okay, and so that kept a lot of those people from voting. And then the other ones were kept from voting through a literacy test. Okay, and so what they did is in order for you to vote, you need to be able to read and write and understand things. And so what they did is they went to, the, or when you went to the polls, they would make you read a section of the Constitution and explain it to them. And we know because we did our scavenger hunt that that's really hard to do. It's not an easy thing to read and understand. We had to look at uh, a simplified version of it to even understand it. And so um, that made it really, really hard for anybody to, uh, to pass this literacy test. And so that would obviously keep almost all of the freedmen because they didn't have the opportunity to have education before, but it also would keep a lot of white people that weren't literate from uh, voting as well. So what they did is they added in something called the grandfather clause. And the grandfather clause was if your father or grandfather could vote in 1867, then you did not have to take the literacy tests. And basically what that's saying is if you're white, then you don't have to take the literacy test because the only people that could vote before uh, 1868 were uh, white people. And so it's kind of a backwards way or, or an underhanded way of saying, you know, black people have to take this literacy test and white people don't. Um, also, new immigrants would have had to take the literacy test. Okay. Um, the other types of laws that were working against 
Jim Crow law or against sorry African Americans were Jim Crow laws and Jim Crow laws were just a bunch of laws that enforce segregation we'll talk about what segregation is on the next slide but um, they were challenged these Jim Crow's laws were challenged over and over and over again um, and every single time that they were challenged it was found that they were legal and that it was uh, okay for the southern states to have these laws so what is the segregation that the Jim Crow laws are trying to uh, make happen and did make happen? Well, what segregation is, is it's the enforced separation of the races. So it's saying that black people and white people need to be separate. They need to have separate everything. Um, and we're going to make sure that the laws say that. Okay, And so we're talking like uh, African-American and white people at this time were born in different hospitals. They were buried in different cemeteries. They played on different playgrounds um, at restaurants. There was separated uh, things like this here, the colored dining room. That would have been where African-Americans were able to eat and the white people were allowed to eat in the main restaurant. Uh, separated schools at, at railroads. There would be separate cars or uh, the African-Americans would have to sit at the back part the freedmen would have to sit at the back part of the rail car and so um you know homer plessy or plessy in plessy versus ferguson uh there was a court case and homer plessy was in louisiana and he was sitting in a whites only railroad car and so he got in trouble and um, it went to court and he was upset about it and so he said this isn't legal you shouldn't be allowed to separate us and put me into a place where I don't want to sit I wanted to sit in that place I should be able to sit there and so the courts looked at it and they said you know what this Louisiana law that that does this that makes you keep separate it's okay it's legal and so they said it's okay to segregate it's okay to separate the races if it is separate but equal and so people just used that those words for a very long time separate but equal was the whole uh, basis for them saying um, that segregation was okay until around the 1950s um, it was just continually used and spoken about over and over and over again however if we look at these things these two pictures alone on the slide separate but equal was not a reality if the colored dining room is a small shed out back and the other people get to eat inside of the restaurant that's unfair um, that is not equal if um, the white school gets all of the new books and and the African-American school just gets the leftover books when the other ones are done with it and they're outdated and things like that. That's not separate but equal. Uh, if the white school gets all the good teachers and the black school doesn't have enough teachers and the classes are way too big and all that kind of stuff, it's not separate but equal. Even looking at these um, water fountains down here in this picture down here, the colored water fountain is just a you know just a regular water fountain whereas the white one's very nice it's refrigerated the cool water that is there all that kind of stuff and so it's a very nice one whereas the colored water fountain is not very nice they're separate but they're not equal uh, as far as sharecropper I, I'd like to explain that in class because it can get a little bit confusing and so I am going to take the time to explain that in class but um, so you don't need to fill it out in your notes right now but I did want to talk about kind of this bottom statement on here. So um, below that line, I wanted to talk about um, after Reconstruction. What ended up starting to happen after Reconstruction is the opportunities that were created during Reconstruction for these African Americans, these new jobs and new skills and all that kind of stuff, they disappeared. People in the South didn't let them do the jobs that they were supposed to be able to do so if they were really really good at something and they were good at a skill like making clothes or something like that the white people wouldn't let them do it down there they would uh, not hire them or not uh, go to their store or something like that and so those opportunities went away and if they were now getting training or education to be teachers or nurses or something like that african americans they weren't allowed to get those jobs and so the jobs that they were qualified for they weren't getting so those opportunities were now gone 
So the South really started to grow um, in the late 1880s. And so in the 1880s, they called it the New South. And they were saying it's the New South because we don't only have cotton anymore. Now we've got other things that um, are making our area, the South, more and more successful. And so here's a few things about the New South that um, really were kind of the the main reason that it was being successful. First off, agriculture did bounce back. After the war, because during the war, agriculture went way, way down because the people were fighting instead of farming. And so the amount of cotton that was being made went way down and the amount of tobacco being made way, went way down. But after the war, there was new record outputs. There was tons and tons of, of cotton and tobacco going out of the South, which meant there was a lot of money coming into the South for those people that had the cotton and tobacco farms. Um, the other thing that the South started to do is started to build their own factories. We knew that the North had this huge advantage in economy and in the war because they had factories. And so they built uh, textile factories, which was the main one, which meant that they could take that cotton that they were farming and they could turn it into usable cloth. So they could make the money off of the cotton and selling that to the factories, but they could also make the money off of the clothes instead of just making the money off the cotton and then having to buy the clothes from England or some other country. And so that really helped out their economy. Uh, the last thing that they were able to do was they had in the South, they had so many great resources like coal and steel and, uh, you know, or iron, I guess, to make steel and all these other different things. And so what they did is they started to develop their own resources. So instead of sending their raw materials to another place and then buying back the products, they started to turn their raw materials into actual usable products. And so overall, the biggest excitement was King Cotton wasn't the only thing around. If cotton started to go down or people didn't like cotton or whatever else, the South could still survive. The South, South could still be a strong economy. So they were not dependent on King Cotton anymore.